everybody. It's uh, it's really lovely to have you attending this uh, webinar section for the um, Allied Health and Mental Health Services in RACFs. My name is uh, Rivka Hagen. I am so pleased to have with me in this section Kim Poyner, uh, I guess my partner in crime here, uh, Dr. Eva Pieco and Jesse Zanker as well, and I'll get them to introduce themselves in a moment. Before we kick off, just a uh, quick acknowledgement that uh, we are meeting on uh, the lands of our traditional custodians. I'm currently in the Jaja Wurrung region in Victoria, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and uh, emerging, and certainly any uh, attendees for this particular recorded uh, webinar. So um, I'm going to hand over to Kim for a quick introduction and, and then our two guests as well. Hi everyone, welcome along today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet. My organisation is MediCoach, my background is nursing and coaching, so executive coaching, change management and quality improvement. Eva. Hi, yeah, hi I'm Dr Eva Pieco. I'm a GP here in Bendigo. I'm a medical advisor for Murray PHN and um, I've been looking after residents in aged care for about 30 years now as part of my GP work. Wonderful. And Jesse? I am uh, Zooming from Jar Jar Wurrung in Yorta Yorta country and like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians, others past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm a geriatrician uh, working in both public and private sectors and uh, a research fellow at Melbourne and Deakin University uh, and uh, a director of a practice. Wonderful, thank you. That was a flying introduction. So for this session, we are going to uh, basically have a conversation about uh, the new Medicare item numbers and services available to um, residential aged care facilities. And to really kick it off, I just want to throw it to the panel and especially um, our two, two guests to just give a bit of an outline of what do services, uh, what do services look like just in the normal space prior to these new services becoming available, um, what, are your, uh, what are your interactions with the RACFs and how is that working now? So Jesse, I might start with you. Sure, so our interactions with RACFs are dependent upon the relationships with the clinicians on the ground, particularly the GPs and the uh, staff that provide direct uh, care for the residents. So depending on where you are and how resource, uh, how resource available um, the facilities are for geriatrician services will, will vary across um, PHN areas, across metropolitan versus rural areas, uh, depending on the availability. So particularly in more city-based, uh, the residential care services offered by geriatricians are in person and they're known as the comprehensive geriatric assessment. They're slightly different to the CMAs that the that, that GPs are very familiar with um, and they require us to meet a number of criteria and assess people holistically and also contribute to advanced care planning and communicate that plan with the clinical staff on the ground, the GP and typically the family and family meetings make up a lot of what we do but during that process we'll often recommend referrals to allied health services and staff depending on what we feel would be beneficial for that resident to meet their values and preferences and their values and preferences might be around quality of life, mobility, getting out to uh, a wedding at the end of the year, those sorts of things, COVID uh, allowing for that. Um, but in the country, the services might be a little bit different and, uh, and maybe related to telehealth, depending on uh, where the geriatricians are available from. Um, and so my, my role is mostly based in the country and it is going into facilities directly and working uh, with the clinical staff and the residents on the ground, uh, but also engaging in case conferencing G with GPs and that's a, a novel model we've set up in a, in a couple of locations to really get the most out of the visits um, and, and open, have open lines of communication between GPs residential care staff and uh, the clinical staff. And we've actually engaged uh, the pharmacies, the pharmacists in, in that process as well to help with the medication reviews. What I'm hearing in all of that is a really quite a, a, a complex framework of services already, isn't it? Um, Ava, how does that interact with the services that you provide as a, a GP in, in this space? Yeah, so there's um, very different models that different GP practices would have with managing practice. Um, residents in aged care. The model that our practice has is we have our GPs assigned 
to different aged care facilities. So we only visit one aged care facility and that if any of the patients from our practice come into that aged care facility, they're taken on by the GP from our group because we found it really difficult because the model that a lot of GPs would be doing is they would have their own patients that have gone into care and they want to do that continuity of care, which is fantastic, but might find themselves working across three, four, five different um, residential aged care facilities, which makes it quite challenging because every facility has different staff members and they have different protocols, different IT systems. So it can make it a bit more difficult. So I can understand the challenges that Jesse and the other geriatricians would have. So we would go and have a nurse do a comprehensive medical assessment once a year and then look at that holistic picture. The GP comes in, reviews it. And from then on, we'll do regular visits usually working with the RN to find out what's going on and um, trying to assist the patient any way they can and working with their family. Then as part of that, we would look at um, any referrals, allied health referrals that we might do. A lot of our allied health referrals though, I would find are generally podiatry and, and this new model is obviously looking at something different. So in terms of Eva, currently you were saying podiatry services are what you would refer to in the creation of a 731 item yep. number, MBS item number. That's right. yep. How do you keep track across all the different facilities of those podiatry appointments and how they're being utilised? Um, we don't. So it's very difficult because it's impossible to keep track because we only get notified. So um, quite often when they've completed the visits that they've been allocated, we might get a letter because that's part of the requirement from the allied health providers and we've completed it, the care. Um, but it's as opposed to when that happens and how it happens, we often don't know. Um, we often know when we've been asked to do more referrals right. because right. different things happen at different times and you're not really aware of it. And in terms of um, mapping those services out, how, what's your normal strategy? What's a typical shared allocation of services that you would provide over that year for podiatry? So generally podiatry get the five visits and so that it either be depending on the needs of the resident because they all have different needs. So someone with diabetes, for example, or high problems with their feet, they might need four weekly, six weekly visits. But on the whole, um, for routine standard, it'd be, they'd be getting visits every eight to 10 weeks. So those five visits would be spread out over the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. So that kind of brings us into that space of the new services um, you know, that have been developed and uh, at this point in time looks like it'll be available until, um, until June 2022. I guess I get, the, I get the sense that it's very likely it's going to have a uh, longer tenure than that, but at this point in time, that's, um, that's we know, what we know about. And I guess in, in response to both, you know, uh, the, the, the Aged Care Royal Commission, as well as the COVID impacts, that, that recognition that additional support services are going to be required, especially in that space of um, physical therapies and mental health services. That's kind of where uh, the new MBS item numbers have been um, developed. How do you see that? And I'm, I'm happy to throw that to either of you kind of rolling out when that's uh, you know, quite a different uh, way of, of delivering services to, uh, to residents. How do you see that playing out? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay, Eva. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jesse. So, so I think uh, it's important to recognise that we've got a, a time-limited period to provide these services. And so it's incumbent upon us to utilise them as much as we can. We know that they will provide benefit for residents. The Royal Commission shed a lot of light on where we can improve and, and, and one of the greatest parts is, is resident mobility, interactions and um, keeping people uh, strong and engaged um, that will help them within their facility and externally to that. And while the evidence is not strong, we do know that engagement in these services in general can uh, in, reduce the risk of falls, complications like pressure injuries, uh, hospitalizations, and most importantly, quality of life. And so the question then becomes, we know these services are good, they're available, how do we logistically maximize uh, their utility? And I think that's um, a, a good point for us to discuss and, and work out together how different practices, and we've already heard from Eva, um, about the variability of different GP practices and the variability of facilities and how they operate, how we can sort of work out the best way and support uh, practices and, and facilities to maximise 
their use of these services that are available to residents because if we don't use them they'll be they'll disappear <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And, and you know i guess uh, you know this is the space where especially uh you know kim has has such insight into uh sort of leveraging oh. And um, you know, ensuring that that we have that communication really being developed, and we know that as far as GP, especially GP practices and RACFs, that it's still quite at a foundational level of, of you know sophistication in terms of how we interact and and how we work together. Kim, what what can you say about that? Yeah, I think it's going to be really dependent on um, having a very collaborative discussion between who's coming in as a GP service and also the residential aged care facility, having that communication pathway, how can we visibly make it less administratively burdensome for all and make sure that obviously we're keeping track of how many services are being utilised. You know, I, I the last thing we want is a GP not being able to access those services for that resident because they actually have to trawl through information. So how can we make it really visible for them and that may mean that for a paper-based system, you might actually have just a check list on the front of their paper file that someone at the nursing residential aged care facility is documenting or the allied health might document there. But that's going to be all very independently discussed, isn't it? What's going to work for each of those facilities? And we know from the McKinsey report, really effective communication across teams, health providers, is a really effective hospital avoidance strategy. So we need to get good at this stuff and make sure that we're making it really visible, but we're not making an administration impact on the, the residential aged care facility as well, because we want patient care to be paramount. Ava? Yeah. Um, so as a GP, I'd love to know how I'd be able to get this activated and get it going, because I've certainly noticed over that COVID lockdown period with people having this access to family, and to visitors is the physical impact. So they're not been walking as much, not moving around the facility, not going out for visits. So losing a lot of confidence in their um, mobilization and how far they can walk and um, getting up and down from chairs and things like that. So certainly that's been very visible. Also mental health wise too, because they're not interacting so socially with as many people and that one-on-one -on -one interaction would be excellent for them. So. I, I, for me, it was just how do I how do I get them to get those extra visits? And as clinicians, Eva <laughs> and, and and those listening will have seen, unfortunately, their residents significantly change over the past yeah. almost eighteen months now. Even even though we do expect changes in people in residential care um, based on the stage in their life, uh, the, the the rate of decline that many of us have unfortunately seen has been pretty profound. And this these extra item numbers and supporting people with allied health services can address that in ways that, that Eva just mentioned. And what about, Jesse? can you speak to the mental health impacts as well? Yeah, uh, the mental health, health impacts have been quite profound. And I think mm -hmm. loneliness has been one of the greatest um, challenges. And, you know, already many people within living within residential care experience loneliness prior to the pandemic where perhaps the thing that they were looking forward to was going out for lunch once a week with their family or, or, or doing those, those, those interactions which may be less frequent than they would like but was something to look forward to. The pandemic and, and isolation requirements has meant there's both reduced frequency of those interactions, the length of them is reduced, the number of visitors they can have has been impacted and the certainty around that can when that can happen, mm. can change rapidly uh, over over the weekend. They might be looking forward to celebrating their 90th birthday, but then that's taken away from them very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so while um, increased uh, allied health isn't a replacement for that, it's something that can improve that social engagement um, and, and that human interaction, which I think a lot of people have missed and have been craving. Absolutely. And there is new mental health item numbers associated with this particular Royal Commission report and obviously MBS opportunities as well. And, and there's group as well. So particular PHNs have, have an allocation of funding to provide group sessions as well so that maybe, you know, they can obviously start to have a little bit more of that um, networking and socialisation and lots of different activities in-house as well. 
And I, th I think, you know, this is sort of starting to kind of get to the heart of the importance of this work. And although we know that technically because of the, the way that the MBS is structured and, and the way that our services run, it can be, you know, really difficult to establish these things. But the, the need that sits behind it kind of should be the, um, you know, the, 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 the reason why we put in the effort to try to make the systems better because, um, it is it, it's so meaningful and it is so important to um, to support the the elderly uh, residents in in the aged care um, facilities. I'd also love to have a bit of a chat about I guess some of those complexities and and what does make it difficult and and what are some of the challenges associated with the new uh, the new service delivery and I know um, Ava you have a fair bit to uh, to contribute to that so shoot. <laughs> Well, so from my reading of the, the new item numbers, and I think firstly, partly for the GPs listening, is that one of the item numbers we don't utilise enough is that contribution to care plan. Because really, almost every time we go, that's what we're doing. We're providing an assessment and we're contributing to the care plan, but we often forget that we can actually um, do that extra 731 item number for that contribution. So I think that's an important thing to realise. You're doing the work anyway, and as long as you document it correctly, then you can um, access that other MBS fee. And as part of that, you can also um, access those extra services for your patients. But one of the challenges I think around it is my reading of it is the additional five visits are for physical therapy. So the exercise physiologist, physiotherapist, and I think occupational therapists, not, not for all the other diabetes educators, dietitians, podiatry. So if we're and they can't access those until the first five have been done and actually delivered. Um, so if their podiatry is being spread out over the year, then they can't actually access these extra five physical services because they're, they're waiting for that podiatry visit, you know, at week 50 or, you know, week 40 before they can access it. So I think we are going to have to think about perhaps talking to our residents and changing the way they, they do it because... Sometimes they want these podiatry item numbers is because they're accessing a different provider to the one that's usually in the aged care, but that comes to the aged care facility where they've got an agreement. But Kim, I'd love your advice on this. <laughs> Thanks. I, I don't know that there's any easy win, to be quite honest with you, but I, I definitely think that there's going to have to be a lot of communication on how are the services delivered, what services are required for this person. And how can we ensure that, you know, in terms of um, distribution of services, that they are able to receive and access those 10 across the course of the year? As Jessie made note at the start, if we don't use them, we lose them. And we've seen that before in MBS task force reviews, haven't we? They've gone back and had a look at the item numbers, you know, to see, and there's different item numbers here, to see and track how often were they used. So if we're not going to use them because we're distributing podiatry across the course of the year, well, then high, high likelihood that they're going to be removed. And the Royal Commission took how many years to actually come up with these findings, you know, that it's really high value for frailty, mm -hmm. prevention, hospital avoidance, if we do access these services. So um, Eva, it may be even having a conversation around, do we do some sort of, um, that the patient has a payment plan or they contribute to their own podiatry services or do they utilise the residential aged care facility podiatry services? So they're kind of the things that on an individual basis need to be discussed, GP and patient, because it's going to be on ability to pay as well, isn't it, affordability? Yeah, and we do want them to continue to have the podiatry because that's really important because, you know, if their feet are sore or they get ulcers, that's a whole lot of extra morbidity for them. Um, but also we want to look after their feet so they can keep moving and be mobile. So that's still really important. So it's just making sure we um, access what we can for them to in, improve their well-being. And I think that's the importance of having it tracked as well. So if we know that, okay, they've only got one more podiatry services before we can access the five, we can see that very visibly in their patient record. 
the way that we have agreed previously that we're going to communicate that information, well, then we can access those additional services that are highly valuable to those patients. And I, I think that's going to be where the two-way communication with the central core family as well, mm -hmm. they're going to know when services are being delivered as well if they're highly involved in, the, in that family member's life. And a question for Eva, is, is there a possibility that in the, 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 G, the CMA that you do, you say, well, I think this person needs to have maximal um, podiatry over the course of the year. Can the podiatrist provide advice how they could structure this to supply this many services? I mean, that, that yes. reverses the, the way it looks, but perhaps then the podiatrist mm -hmm. could provide that information as to how they could structure it if the allied health mm -hmm. staff are aware of how these IPTA numbers work, not, not to sort of um, exploit the system in any way, but to yeah. ensure that there's another safety net of maximising resident access to those, those numbers. Yes, they, they certainly can. And they're usually very good at keeping it on top of it all because they know when they visit, mm. we, we don't know. But I think it's that multidisciplinary model that's really important. And it you know, does lead the way for perhaps looking at some more case conferencing or better communication across the different services. And I would love you to do case conferencing. You know, that's <laughs> look at my face just lit up case conferencing. It's one of my favourite ways of, you know, having that 3D, 3D information imparted rather than trawling and not having information. And how can we, in, in terms of quality of life, you know, that's essentially what that, that um, client and patient wants in that residential aged care facility, right? And the family. So how can we make sure that we're creating the best impact that we can? And that's through having 3D conversations like case conferencing. And, and, and it, is, it is brilliant case conferencing. And, and certainly that's, that's the gold standard model within a hospital setting where I suppose you've got the allied health staff and clinicians captive and the nursing staff. So you can all uh, discuss what, what the resident goals are or the patient's goals are in that setting. So how do you translate that to the residential care setting? And I suppose we, I mentioned in the introduction, we do case conferencing and one of the models that we run, it's, it's fortunate because I actually visit that GP clinic and sit in the rooms and the facility is, the residential care facility is co-located, so it's next door. And so the same GPs use the same software visit the facility and we uh, have a meeting once a month over an hour um, where the clinical care coordinator is present and she represents the allied health staff as well as the nursing concerns there. And we have about four to five GPs come along and the community pharmacist who does the medication reviews mm. as well. And so we all discuss um, the residents who I've seen, or if there are questions for residents that are going to be referred or just general cl clinical questions, we can work them out together. And each um, clinician will bring a different angle to that conversation. But in the end, I suppose we're, we're just adding to the, um, the, the, the plan for that resident in making sure that all of those needs are met and we're all on the same page so that, that it's not just a piecemeal service where people are providing opinions um, and there's not really, a, a, I suppose, a, a common thread to the conversation. And that's beneficial in multiple ways because um, the clinicians present can um, bill for that and the practice nurse will also take the case conferencing notes so it meets all of those requirements for, for, for governance and, and diligence. It's just perfectionism. Um, uh, Eva, I also uh, want to, to ask you, as, especially about the new mental health care items um, mm -hmm. for RACFs. So we know that uh, previously, this was like a total gap in, in mm -hmm. service, um, service eligibility in that there was just no, uh, there were no item numbers that really could be used in, in that setting. So now um, the, the services kind of mirror the, the better access model of, of mental mm. health services. How do you see that playing out in, uh, in the RACF space? So I think it's very much needed, as, as we mentioned, you know, um, residents are often lonely before they get there. They've also often been at home by themselves or struggling on their own on, well, and a lot of anxiety um, a lot of anxiety and a lot of grief about being in that position. Um, we know that a lot of um, people will say, I don't ever want to go to live in a residential aged care facility. It's their mindset of way they, they look at it. Um, it, was, it was almost like a failure in the part or, or that being from away from their own homes, that loss of control. So 
I think that it's something really important to be able to help residents unpack some of those feelings and work through them and to be able to look at it perhaps in a different way and trying to see the more positive side of it. Um, and they have been very much lacking. And it's not something also we often think to do. So I think it's a great initiative. I think the challenge will be, and I hate to be a negative Nancy, but I think the challenge will be is finding the providers. There's, you know, even in, in private practice, um, trying to find um, providers, particularly in the rural areas, is very difficult with long waiting lists. So, um, but I think that it is a space that a lot of providers would be very happy to, to work in because they see the, the benefit of it for the residents. And, you know, we all have parents. And so, you know, a lot of us have, have gone through or seen what, um, what it's like for the challenges for the older population. Yeah, exactly. And I guess that brings us sort of to one of the, the, the key points too, that um, all of this sort of service development um, is throttled by uh, resources. And, and that is, you know, having the right experts available at the right place at the right time. And, you know, there really are no simple solutions to that, are there? No. Health pathways. So most of the PHNs have health pathways. And so that's a, a directory you can go to to see where your providers are and who might be available to you. And, you know, certainly rural workforce agencies are also, um, you know, very much involved in, in placing um, allied health and, um, you know, hopefully mental health uh, services within uh, the, the more rural areas as well. So um, hopefully, you know, that uh, that pathway is, uh, is, is kind of assisting in, in that space as well. Um, I guess before we, we wrap it up, um, I'd love to know if there are any sort of final thoughts or uh, ideas that we would like to, to bring to the audience. I'll start with you, Jess. Well, I think on Eva's point about the, the mental health services, I think that's a really important one. And I think the notion of build it and they will come is applicable here. So the item numbers have been built. We may not have the providers immediately there, but if we don't have the framework for them to, to mm. be enticed to, to enter into the space, then they will not ever enter. And so I think even if um, referrers, GPs and, and clinical care coordinators and RNs aren't familiar with those services, there are the, the ways to, to look them up, as Eva mentioned, through the PHN Health Pathways, but also documenting that we would even as the GP just documenting or the geriatrician, for example, just documenting that this person would really benefit from um, a psychological or counselling mm -hmm. support, then that becomes incumbent upon the clinical staff to, to seek those things out. And if we don't ask, we don't get. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important to continue to ask for these things. Otherwise, there'll be no recognition that they're needed. And mm -hmm. once again, um, as, as Kim more eloquently Put, use it or lose it we've got to use these item numbers and get the benefit from them yeah great point um eva uh, i just think it's for for gps out there to have a think about and for the clinical staff the nursing staff and the residents to think of outside the square rather than management all being medical as in medicines management that these services could make an incredible difference to residents and their quality of life and to think about accessing them because it's the, you know, the more people we have involved in helping someone um, reach their goals, the more chance they're going to likely to be successful. So to take that little bit of extra time to work out how to do it and what to do. And as I said, a lot of the time we're doing the work anyway, it's about the documentation and how we and how we bill for it really. So um, making sure that we maximize it to the benefit of the resident. Excellent. What about you, Kim? Well, maximize your communication. <laughs> maximise communication internally, externally and advocacy for those patients so that they have those quality of lives that they deserve. Wonderful. So, um, look, I'd like to, to thank uh, everyone on the panel for a, a really robust discussion. We've, we've touched on just so many areas and um, certainly the, you know, the detail of the item numbers and the services that we've kind of been uh, discussing here are available in, in the other recorded modules. So if you haven't seen those yet, please uh, do refer to those to get better sort of in-depth knowledge about what those new services and requirements are um, all about. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for having us.